we're getting to that point in the season where I feel like we can start talking about teams and players and the result of the conversation not be, well, it doesn't matter because it's just a couple of games in, it's too early to come to conclusions. And while ultimately I do feel like it is still way too early to completely write off teams, unless that team is the San Jose Sharks, but every team in the NHL have played between 7 to 10 games. The teams that have played 10, that's basically an eighth of the season. That's not nothing. So in today's video, we are going to go over the most surprising and disappointing NHL teams so far this season. Tomorrow, I'll be putting out another video just like this for you guys, but instead of teams, we're going to look at players. So if this is your first time checking out the channel and you want more NHL content just like this all season long, hit that subscribe button. So with that all being said, let's go ahead and start the video off with a disappointing team, the Minnesota Wild. Just three wins through their first nine games. Now they have racked up a couple of overtime losses, so they've gotten points in more than just three games, but their 3-4-2 record is good for just six place in the Central Division, a Central Division that doesn't look the greatest this year. Only three teams in the Central currently over 500. Those teams are the Avalanche, Stars, and Jets. Now, it's not like this is a team that had sky-high expectations coming into the season, but for the most part, I feel like a lot of people predicted them to make the playoffs and had them finishing somewhere between third and fourth in the Central. Through nine games, this does not look like a playoff team. The offense has been good. They are top 10 in the league in terms of goals for per game, but defense and goaltending has been a serious problem for the Wild so far. Gustafson and Flurry have basically been splitting starts. Gustafson has started five games, Flurry has started four, and neither of the two have been good. Only four teams are allowing more shots against per game on average than the Minnesota Wild. The Minnesota Wild are allowing the most goals against per game on average. Those are concerning numbers for a team that has notoriously been very good defensively and have gotten very good goaltending over the last couple of seasons. Defense and goaltending is really the only reason this Minnesota Wild team made the playoffs last year. Of all the NHL teams that made the postseason last year, the Minnesota Wild averaged the least amount of goals for per game during last year's regular season by quite a wide margin. Now again, the offense has been much better this season, but I don't really think it's sustainable. The Wild are currently shooting 8.46% on unblocked shot attempts, which is the second highest mark in the league only behind the Los Angeles Kings. For a team that doesn't have a lot of snipers, isn't built to be an offensive powerhouse, I have my doubts on if they're going to be able to keep that up. So if the offense regresses to the mean like I'm expecting it to, and the defense and goaltending doesn't tighten up, things could get ugly for the Minnesota Wild pretty quickly. Moving on now to one of the most surprising teams in the league so far, we have the Montreal Canadiens, who currently have a record of 5-2-2, two two, good for third place in the Atlantic Division. For a team that the majority of people had written off before the season even began, almost 99% of the season standings predictions that I saw before the season began had Montreal finishing last place in the Atlantic. Habs fans have to be pretty happy with where the team is at right now, unless there's somebody who wanted the best odds at the first overall draft pick, you're probably pretty upset with what's going on, especially considering how dominant Macklin Celebrini looks at the NCAA level as the youngest player in the league. But luckily for those Montreal fans, this start to the season probably isn't sustainable. You look at the numbers, it doesn't really back up the 5-2-2 two two record that they have. This hot start to the season has largely been on the back of timely goal scoring from the likes of Cole Caulfield and Sean Monaghan, and especially otherworldly goaltending from Jake Allen, who through four starts has a 3-0-1 record, a 9-30 save percentage, and according to Evolving Hockey's model, has the sixth highest goal saved above expected in the league. And if you're somebody who's followed the Montreal Canadiens, watched Jake Allen play over the last couple of seasons, those numbers probably aren't sustainable. But hey, you never know, without random goaltending is in the NHL, maybe he wins the Vezina Trophy this year and carries Montreal to the playoffs on his back. Moving along now to another disappointing team, we have the Calgary Flames, who I would say were one of the most disappointing teams in the league last season, and it looks like they're on track to be one of the most disappointing teams again this year. They haven't been scoring enough goals, they've been allowing too many goals. Jacob Markstrom, while his numbers have gotten slightly better from last season, still doesn't look great. Jonathan Huberto has just five points points in nine games. He's scoring at about the same pace he did last season. Is this just what Jonathan Huberto is now? I feel like it's time for the Calgary Flames to take a real long look in the mirror and maybe think about shifting gears and heading in a different direction. There's been talk recently that they're still trying to get extensions done with Noah Hannafin and Elias Lindholm. I don't think that makes any sense for the Calgary Flames. Those are two very valuable trade ships that can really kickstart.
start a rebuild slash retool in terms of the kind of return they could get for each of those guys. I know it's difficult to go in a direction like that when you have guys like Jonathan Huberto, who's in the first year of a contract that pays him 10.5 mil a season, Nazem Kadri, Mackenzie Weger, they're locked up in long-term deals, but I think it's very clear that this core just isn't it, and it's not just from the sample size we've seen this season, it's going back to last season as well. I really believe the Calgary Flames need to make some big roster moves, some tough decisions, or they're just going to be stuck being mediocre for a long time, or even worse than mediocre, which is what they've been so far this season. Continuing on now, next up we have another surprising team, the Anaheim Ducks, 5-4 and four through 9 games, 10 points, 4th place in the Pacific Division, they are winners of 4 straight, and they've been really fun to watch. The way they're getting some of these wins, the comeback victory over the Boston Bruins, scoring 2 goals late to tie it up at 3 and then winning in overtime, their most recent win over the Pittsburgh Penguins, which was one of the craziest finishes to a game that I've seen in a long time. The Penguins were in the last couple seconds of a 5-on-3 in the dying seconds of the third period in a tie game. Mason McTavish winds up getting a breakaway out of the box and winning the game. Now, the Ducks are another one of those teams similar to Montreal where the numbers probably don't back up the record that they have right now, but if you're a Ducks fan, aside from the results of the games, you just have to be very happy with a lot of the individual performances. Mason McTavish looks like an absolute star, 11 points in 9 games. Frank Vetrano has been one of the most surprising players in the league. He's goal per game through 9 games. If Pavel Minshikov keeps up this play at both ends of the ice, he's going to be in Calder Talks all season long. In the 5 games he's played this season, Leo Carlson looks very good. Even if the Ducks do regress, which I am expecting them to, I don't think anybody views them as a legit threat for the playoffs, there's still so much to like about this Ducks team. Shifting focus now back to another disappointing team, we have the Edmonton Oilers, both Alberta teams off to very slow starts this year. And when it comes to the Edmonton Oilers, usually the case is, while well, they're scoring a lot of goals, the power play is magnificent, but the defense and goaltending hasn't been good. And while that has been the case this season, the defense and goaltending hasn't been good, the offense hasn't been anything special either. They're 23rd in the league in goals for per game. Their power play is 10th, which obviously a top 10 power play in the league is still very solid. But this is a team that usually has one of, if not the best power plays in the league year in and year out with McDavid and Dreisaitl on the roster. Now, the Oilers have actually been generating the majority of scoring chances in most of their games at 5 on 5, but aside from the usual suspects, McDavid and Dreisaitl, the finishing ability just hasn't been there. When it's not those two guys creating and finishing plays, there isn't really a whole lot going on. I still think this team makes the playoffs. I don't see Jack Campbell and Stuart Skinner being this bad all season long. They're also in a weak Western Conference, which should help, but it is very tough to look at this Edmonton Oilers team as a legit Stanley Cup contender right now, which was the expectation for this team heading into the season. Moving along now to another one of the most surprising teams in the league, we have the Detroit Red Wings, who have slowed down after their 5-1 and one start to the season, but 6-3-1 and one still is good enough for second place in the Atlantic Division, only behind the Bruins. The big story for the Red Wings this season has been the offense. They are tied for the third most goals for per game in the league currently averaging four. They still have the fourth best power play at 32.4%, although it has really cooled down over the last few games. Defensively, this team has been mediocre. The goaltending has been fine. It hasn't been the reason Red Wings are winning games. The reason they've been winning games is the offense. Now, that being said, they're in a similar situation to the Minnesota Wild, where I feel like they kind of have an unsustainably high shooting percentage right now, and it's likely going to come down, but I'm not expecting it to completely fall off of a cliff either, because it's not like this is the same Red Wings roster that they had last year. Steve Eisenman brought in guys throughout the offseason to help score goals. He brought in snipers like Daniel Sprong, obviously the big one, Alex Dabrinkit, who's been unreal. Shane Gossespierre was brought in to inject some offense from the blue line and help the power play. He's done that. The numbers reflect it. He's been great. Well, I don't think the Red Wings are going to finish the season as a top three team in the Atlantic. If they can continue to get, at the very least, serviceable defense and goaltending, I think they have all the makings of being a team that should be able to stay in the the playoff hunt all season long and be competing for a wild card spot down the stretch. Next up, we have the final disappointing team that I'm going to cover in this video, the Pittsburgh Penguins, who are currently three and six through nine games, dead last in the Metro Division. Now, in a lot of games this season, the Pittsburgh Penguins probably deserved a much better fate. I don't think they've played that bad up until this point, like their record shows. That being said, there's no changing their three and six record right now, which is definitely a big disappointment considering the move that the Penguins made in the offseason, bringing in the likes of Riley Smith, obviously Eric Carlson, which was a blockbuster deal. You would hope that if they continue to play the way that
they're playing, the results will come. I feel like the most recent loss to the Ducks was just a cherry on top to a miserable start to the season. Still can't get over how they lost that one. Tristan Jari is somebody who definitely has to be better. He has not carried his weight up until this point after signing a nice big extension in the offseason. They need more from him, especially considering the fact that they don't really have a stable option behind Tristan Jari as it's Alex Nedeljkovic and Magnus Helberg, who have both already seen some time this year. As somebody who watched Nedeljkovic and Helberg with the Red Wings all of last season, I wouldn't really have a lot of faith in those guys' ability to carry the load if the starter isn't performing well. So again, Jari's got to be better. I think the Penguins will be fine, but just based off of pure results, wins and losses, up until this point, they've definitely been one of the league's most disappointing teams in my opinion. And now finally finishing out the video with the last surprising team, we have the Vancouver Canucks, who are currently 6-2-1 and one through 9 games, 13 points, second place in the Pacific, only behind the Vegas Golden Knights. You've got Elias Pettersson playing like a Hart Trophy candidate right now, Quinn Hughes playing like a Norris candidate, and Thatcher Demko playing like a Vesna candidate. When you get a bonus superstar at each position like that, you're going to be in pretty good shape. And while those three guys do deserve a ton of credit, the likes of JT Miller have been very good as well. He continues to thrive under Rick Tockett. Brock Besser is producing at a rate we've never seen him produce at in his career. Philip Hironik looks very comfortable and looks like the ideal partner next to Quinn Hughes. Special teams have been good, especially the power play. The penalty kill, you know, only 16th ranked in the league, but you'll take that considering how atrocious the penalty kill was for the Canucks last season. Vancouver fans have to be very happy with where the team is at right now. And I'll mention this again, the Western Conference doesn't look great this year, the Pacific Division especially, so getting off to a hot start like this could go a long way for the Canucks in terms of them getting into the playoffs. So that is going to wrap up this video. Those were, in my opinion, the most surprising and disappointing NHL teams so far this season. If there's any team that I didn't mention in this video that you've been disappointed by or really surprised by in a good way, of course, let me know who those teams are down below in the comments. If you guys enjoyed today's video, please be sure to leave it a like. That is the best way to show your support and most most importantly, if this was your first time checking out the channel and you want NHL content just like this all year round, hit that subscribe button and I'll talk to you all soon.